There we go. All right, so I should have introduced myself and then let my <laughs> co-presenter introduce himself. So my name is Matt Kreit. Um, I use they, them pronouns. I am a teaching and learning specialist here at AU in our Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning. Uh, I'm Sahil Mathur. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a graduate assistant for teaching, at le teaching and learning at CTRL. All right, so our guidelines for participation, if you've been in a CTRL workshop before, you've likely seen these. Um, but we've updated them a bit for this kind of new hybrid uh, format that we're trying to take for a lot of our sessions. So please make yourself comfortable throughout the workshop. Get up and move around if you need to. Stim, rock, fidget, craft, whatever you want to do in order to make it so that you can participate. We encourage you to do so. Um, be present, so participate in activities in a way that works for you. Obviously, a large portion of this session is going to be peer review. So if you'd like to get the most out of that, that would require... Uh, kind of active participation in that. Um, I don't think we have anybody on Zoom, but if anybody who is on Zoom, please uh, use the raise hand function to one, speak. One by spin on Zoom. Great, yeah. welcome Zoom uh, individual. <laughs> We're excited to have you. Uh, but if you would like to speak, please use that raise hand function, or if you're in person, uh, also raise your hand so that we know. Um, we'd encourage folks to share your name before speaking, and that's an accessibility thing, so that folks on Zoom know who's speaking in person, Similarly, folks in person know who's speaking on Zoom. Um, if you're on Zoom, feel free to use the chat to, to ask questions and share ideas. And then as always, we encourage folks to be generous with your knowledge and respectful of other folks' knowledge. So our overview of the session. So like I mentioned, we'll briefly review some best practices for syllabus tone, policies, and organization. Um, then the majority of our session will be focused on sharing and receiving that peer feedback and allowing you the chance to apply various knowledge that you already have or what we share with you uh, to review your peers' syllabi. Brief agenda, we're a little bit behind, but that's all right. We have a lot of built-in time to our peer review section. So we'll talk a little bit about AU's syllabus template, um, which gives you a sense of, uh, you know, some of the key things that we think are important to include in the syllabus. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about syllabus tone and the research around something called a warm tone and how that helps invite our students into our syllabi and into our classes. Then we'll have that big peer review portion and then just do a quick wrap up. So key components of a syllabus, likely you all know this as you are instructors, um, but these are the components that are shared on that syllabus template that I mentioned. So you'll have instructor information. So that's things like your name, what you'd like to be called in the classroom, um, how students should refer to you. That's a big thing that I like to encourage folks to share. So if you want your students to say, uh, to only call you say Dr. Kreit, then make sure to make that clear because a lot of students don't understand or don't know that maybe they shouldn't call their female professors Miss Smith or that they shouldn't call their professor uh, Professor Smith if they don't have a doctor. So it's kind of whatever you'd like. Uh, your students to refer you refer to you as I encourage you to include that. Um, then you'll include some course details like learning outcomes, uh, um, uh, organization of the course, kind of the that schedule table that a lot of people have in terms of, you know, this is our class session. This is what we'll be talking about on this particular day. These are your assignments that are due. You always want to include information about grading and assessment. So how will students be evaluated? and what assessments will they need to complete, uh, various course expectations and policies, and then university-wide policies that are applicable to you, academic support services, such as the ASAC or the Dean of Students Office, and then student support services, such as the food pantry or writing services or various tutoring services. And you can kind of choose, pick and choose which ones of those you think are most applicable to your course. Some of those student support services or the academic support services may be relevant for your class, but they may not. So there's like a writing lab, which is likely relevant for lots of folks' classes, but there's a math and statistics tutoring lab, which if you're not teaching math or statistics, you probably wouldn't want to include that support on uh, your syllabus. So with that in mind, we do have a syllabus template, like I mentioned, so that has all of the information that was on this previous slide kind of organized in individual sections that you might find useful. It also has um, key guiding questions to consider as you go throughout your syllabus, as well as examples of various policies that you might uh, include. So it has a communication policy, it has a participation policy, it has attendance policies. All of these uh, just as ideas for things that you could include. You're welcome to take the language that we have and use it directly on your syllabus 
or adapt it to make it a little bit more relevant to your own teaching context. And to give you an idea, again, of what this syllabus template includes, so it has those syllabus uh, components that I mentioned, various examples of policies that you can pull from or adapt, questions to consider, and then additional resources to review in the event that we don't have a sample policy or there's just additional information that we think could be helpful for you all. So what does that actually look like? Um, so this is just a screenshot of the syllabus template. Um, the first page of it, so it has this section with instructor information uh, and prompts you to share, you know, information about the instructor, name, pronouns, contact information, office hours, communication policy, instructor bio, and kind of going throughout all of the things that you might include in the syllabus. And what we've added are comments all throughout the syllabus with those things to consider. So this one says, consider including a section about how you would like students to address you. And it has an example, you can call me Shakia, Dr. Harris, Dr. Shakir, or any combination of those. Please do not use gendered honorifics for me. So just an example of what a particular communication policy or um, how you want students to refer to you policy could look like. And with that, I'll pass it over to Sahil to talk a little bit about uh, positive syllabus tone, and then we'll go into that section with uh, referencing uh, peer feedback and letting you all get that chance to really go through your peer, peer feedback together and get some uh, additional insight from fellow instructors. Thanks, Mike. Um, so we've gone over what a syllabus is and some of its main components. Let's talk a little bit about how students view the syllabus and what it does for them. So very often students can form their first impressions of what the course and the instructor is or is going to be based on their reading of the syllabus. Research has shown that such first impressions are created by syllabi. So as instructors, it's, 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 it's essential that we consciously try and think about how we can create a welcoming space through that syllabus, through the language that we use. Um, so how do we engage in a positive, motivating tone of speaking to our students um, through the syllabus? That's something that we're going to go over for the next couple of slides. Research has shown that syllabi that focus on learning related aspects, how students learn the material, rather than syllabi that try to convey to students everything that they should know in terms of content and policies. Um, those learning focused syllabi have been shown to significantly uh, result in stronger uh, perceptions by the student of the course, the instructor, as well as the document itself, right? Um, so this is a quote from one of our student partners at CDRL, um, which says that when the syllabus isn't responsive, you're treating students as bodies in a classroom rather than as individuals. Uh, and the idea behind this is think about the syllabus as a conversation between yourself and the students, even though it's a one-way conversation. Think about it as you're speaking to someone else and trying to explain to them and convey to them what you want, rather than sort of... Uh, giving them all the information that is possible and necessary through the syllabus, right? Try, try and make it a conversation within the confines of what a syllabus can do. Uh, we've come up with a couple of guiding principles for syllabi to keep in mind as you develop them. So the content and policies are essential because that's what syllabi are, right? But it's, we can also sort of work with that and do that with a warm and inviting tone. So a couple of things to keep in mind while formulating and writing the content and policies. Be detailed, uh, convey what you want to convey, but do so in a clear and simple manner. Try not to be too verbose with the language. Uh, be direct with your language. Um, make sure the students understand what you're trying to say. Um, and avoid joking and sarcasm because those can sometimes not come across as intended in written form. Uh, try and consider students whose first language isn't English. This goes along. So if you're direct and if you're clear, it's likely you're using simpler English language. Um, so that works with that as well. Wherever possible, use examples. Um, for example, if there is, uh, if you want to talk about how to read a text, how to read a particular text, you can share your approach. That when I read a text, I do these things, right? So that's giving the students an example of what you're trying to get them to. Um, and this is also sort of modeling. I said use an example, and I tried to give an example of how to do that. Um, and then also consider incorporating structured flexibility into course policies. We have another slide on what that might look like for different aspects. Um, all of this can be done using a warm and inviting tone. So try and aim for that. Convey a mindset where the aim of the course is for students to learn rather than 
for you as the instructor to teach them in a narrow sense of just uh, giving knowledge to them. So personalize your syllabus, use I statements, use you statements. Instead of saying students will do X, Y, Z, you can say you will engage in these assignments. Um, that helps. And also use the syllabus as a space to convey values that you find are important to you as an instructor. So that's uh, also is a way of conveying to the students how you might approach the course overall and might shape how they perceive it. Um, some examples of what a commanding or a cold tone looks like versus an inviting or a warm tone. So things like you must complete makeup work could be rephrased as feel free to complete makeup work. Um, instead of saying you are allowed to, you can phrase it as you are welcome to. Um, instead of being restrictive, I only accept or uh, students may not do X, Y, Z, you can say I encourage you to do um, whatever it is. Um, late work can be phrased in a positive way as well. Instead of saying a late penalty or something that's deducted from your score, you can say it's eligible for a certain percentage of the original score. Um, in terms of office hours, instead of saying, instead of sort of leaving it open to them, if you need to contact me, you can say, I invite you to contact me. That creates a more inviting office hour space. Um, I'm not going to go over this slide in detail, but these are just some further uh, text for how you can incorporate a, a warm tone as opposed to a cold or a commanding tone. Um, some examples of what a flexible structure looks like or incorporating structured flexibility into your syllabus. There can be flexibility with attendance policies, a body system where if you miss a class, you make sure that someone else sort of, you, you have someone who is uh, getting you caught up, that, 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 that way they don't miss out. Uh, offer a Zoom or online option to students who cannot make a particular session. Um, offer a few freebie absences, potentially including makeup work that um, sort of is not too burdensome, um, and give them credit for learning activities that they do and not just simply attending class. One of my professors at SIS over here gave us credit for attending uh, workshops at think tanks downtown and attending sessions on current events um, if, we, if we could not attend a particular class. Um, have flexibility with the due dates. Um, students approach or students like having at least some flexibility, knowing that it's not a hard deadline. So there are various ways to go about this. Uh, consider grade days, consider having submitted by this weekend. So that gives them some additional time to think about it. Um, and additional flexibility in assignments. So you can have like top four out of five quiz scores, you drop the lowest score, things like that. Scaffolded assignments also students like them because they're not sort of working toward one thing at the end without receiving feedback before. Um, and these scaffolded assignments can be low stakes toward the beginning or not graded at all. And then the final grade is uh, a cumulative effort. Um, this is another quote from one, one of our CTRS student partners. Sorry, could you repeat? Scaffolded assignments. What is that? Right, mean? sorry. Um, so a scaffolded assignment, for example, um, if there's a big policy memo assignment that's due at the end of the semester. You could say, um, you know, by week five, give me a proposal. By week eight, give me a background of the topic that you have. Uh, by week 11, give me a draft of the three recommendations you're going to make. And for each of those, you don't necessarily have to give very uh, involved or a lot of feedback, but just it's a way for them to do that work before and submit it to you. You can either choose not to grade that, or you can choose to grade it as a very small component of the final score, low stakes grading. And that way, they're not sort of relying on your encountering their policy memo for the first time right at the end, uh, but they have gotten some feedback in the process as well. So scaffolded assignments, is, uh, that's what I meant by scaffolded Thank assignments. Thank you. Thanks. Um, this is another quote from one of our CTR student partners um, who's complaining about burnout at the end of, this, end of the semester. Professors often acknowledge that uh, students experience this burnout, but don't respond or don't shape their syllabi in ways that respond. So think about quality over quantity and how to reduce content or teach material in a less stressful way at times when you know that students will be overwhelmed, right? So syllabi typically build up as semesters go on, but it would be better if it got heavier and then got lighter again. Uh, the broad idea here is think about the students and how they experience the semester and try and not have all the assignments due right at the end. Um, that's one way of in interpreting this. Before we move on to the workshop part of this workshop, where you will be engaging with your peers, any questions? What questions do you have? Yes, I have yeah. a question. So I'm new to all this, so you have to forgive me. But uh, I do know that I have at least three um, international students who, who uh, may not 
be native English speakers. Is there language access here at AU or translation services for non-native English speakers? Um, I'm not aware. You don't think? Yeah. There is a program for teaching English as a second language. Um, it's called TESOL, and I think there are a couple of faculty who run that. Um, and I think students can also access the writing center for help with writing their own assignments. I'm not certain that there, there is sort of translation access uh, at so EU. I'm a professor in the yeah. TESOL program. Yeah. And we, so the TESOL program actually is preparing future English teachers. So we don't work a lot directly with international students. Um, but there is, in the syllabus guidelines that CTRL shares, there's links to the International Student Services, yes. ISSS, and they are kind of a hub for International Student Services. Um, that would be a place that students could go to learn about the different support services available to them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that question. But just to, to underscore, I think if we try and be clear and direct, it's less likely we'll be using language that is not as easily understood by international students. So I think those general principles also help with addressing uh, the non-native speaker uh, aspect as well. Yeah, okay. And I think the, just to add on, the writing center can be really helpful, particularly for international students, because they're still learning how to write in kind of like the American academic format. Um, so those writing, uh, writing, pro, or writing center tutors can help those students both figure out how to convey their like, their information in a way that's understandable to like English speakers, but also do some of that just the general grammatical editing that students may need if their first language isn't English. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Any other questions? Okay, then let's let's move shopping now. Um, so in preparation for reviewing each other's syllabi, we've asked you to think about um, what components of your syllabus you like feedback on and what specific questions you want to ask your partner. Consider focusing on various aspects such as assignment details, the overall flow or tone of the syllabus, uh, grading policies or other policies that are part of the syllabus. Um, you can always access these slides as well as the syllabus template from those links at the top. Um, that's, these are some guiding questions that you can keep, that you can refer to while you're doing the peer review. I'm not going to go over these in detail. Uh, for the peer feedback, we have we have the suggested timeline, but you can sorry. let's let them think about what what they want to focus on, and okay. then we'll go through the okay, awesome. So yeah, just just take about five minutes uh, to think about what about your syllabus you want to get feedback on, and then we'll move to uh, the grouping and the peer review. Okay, I have one yeah. more question in the meantime. Yeah. Um, so I'm an adjunct, and I have a day job. Uh, is it normal for sort of agency, uh, like federal agency em employees who teach here to have a, the requirement to put a disclaimer in their syllabus about, you know, this is not the, I'm, I'm not saying things on behalf of my agency, I'm saying mm -hmm. as a person teaching, or is, there, is that normal? I don't know. I'm not sure if I've seen it. I don't think it's going to harm you if you do include it, and it might be helpful for you in terms of your in terms of your day job. In the event that something does happen, you know, you're not speaking on behalf of whatever governmental agency you work for. Instead, you're speaking on behalf of you as a as a human. But I, I haven't seen that in syllabi here. Um, that being said, I haven't seen every single syllabus that somebody sure. has. Yeah. Okay, thanks. yeah. Thanks for that question. Yeah, so take another four or five minutes to think about, and then we'll uh, move into groups. And just making sure everybody does have their syllabus that they can share with their partners. And if you don't, just uh, pull it up on your phone or something so that you'll be able to share it with your partner so that when we get to that peer review section, you'll have a chance to uh, share it with your partner.
I do have a question for you. Yeah. Is there guidance from the university on the extent to which you can prohibit the use of AI to write papers? So there is a lot of basically TBD. the way the <laughs> TBD. <laughs> I mean, at least so far, the language that we have from the Office of Academic Integrity, who's run by Allison Thomas, um, is that basically it's up to the instructor about how you would like students to use or not use AI in your syllabus. Um, so what Allison has is a bunch of basically sample policies for strict no use. Um, kind of conditional use and then full permissive use. Um, I would say the easy, so I can, so Allison has a SharePoint website for academic integrity, which I can find for you. Um, communication. communication. But I'll note that in our syllabus template, we've copied all of those example policies that she has. So for the strict, okay. the conditional. Yeah. Um, so if you want to go back to the syllabus template QR code. Um, you, or should I just give them this screenshot? Uh, I don't know. If, uh, or well, yeah. So in, in that syllabus template, yeah, that'll be easier. Um, yeah. So if you go to page three or four of the syllabus template, um, so like this, in, there's a comment that has those sample AI policies. Yeah, you can download the syllabus template from this QR code. Or it's also obviously on our website. Yeah. The reason I asked is because we did an orientation for SBA um, last week, and that was a, yeah, go ahead. a bit of yeah. a discussion. Are there some syllabus Whether elements we were that allow it have to be included in all syllabi, or is it just all the instructors to um, have an instructor? Give a sign Typically, like, there are a bunch of policies or so that always. Yeah, be yeah, developed. university policies that, so that right uh, need but to be included. So, CPR has an online resource on building syllabi, and there's sample text for each of those like policies. Um, for example, it wasn't really the, the university emergency response policy, or okay. um, access so to or health you are uh, mental health to services. Um, I can that. share the link. To, I don't think the link is linked yeah. to that, but it's how, on how well CPR is resource website. And another thing to keep in mind is that um, any of those and AI detectors, those, like those even the one they just don't work. Yeah, so so unfortunately, those um, a big thing that uh, that Allison's office has shared is that any scores on those AI detectors they can't be used as the basis of an academic integrity violation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.